you guys just a few things. Um, Facebook service tonight, a few things to remember, the uh, drive-in wedding shower for Morgan Ransom and Zach Hall this Saturday, 5 to 7, coming off Franklin Street, just circle around, camp and eat, you'll see where everything's set up, look for the balloons, the tents, you'll see all that, start from 5 to 7 Saturday, and this coming Sunday, once again, we're going to do our outdoor service, 9, 30, and 11, uh, bring your chair with you, if you don't have a chair, you can watch in the car, we'll, we'll make accommodations for you, we'll have some chairs if you need them, but uh, come and be part of that, we had a great service this past Sunday, know we're going to have another great one this coming Sunday, so look forward to seeing you. Pastor Cameron, please. Appreciate you, my friend. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter number four. As I promised or warned you last week, uh, each Wednesday night we'll be looking at a different character of the Bible. And uh, tonight looking at a character that while we do not know her actual name, she's known by two names in John 4. And that is the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well. And what we're going to do tonight, we're going to look at her story that you probably already know. But we're going to look at the end of the story more than the beginning. Because it's quite interesting. And if you want to take notes, they'll be simple tonight. We're going to be speaking on the subject, evidence of an encounter. Evidence of an encounter. In other words, when you and I have truly met the Lord Jesus Christ, there should be enough physical evidence, emotional evidence, spiritual evidence of that encounter that others can see and that he would be glorified. So John chapter 4, actually let's begin looking in verse number 28. The Bible says this, The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all the things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on Jesus because of the sayings of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. Father, in these times of study, how I pray for the anointing of God, God for this clarity of mind and of speech that I say those things well pleasing in thy sight. God, that you'd open the ears, the hearts, and the very lives of those that are hearers tonight, that we would be not only hearers, but doers of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Look verse number four by way of introduction. The Bible says, and Jesus must needs go through Samaria. It's interesting to note, Jesus, of course, being a natural born Jew, and this woman of Samaria that he would meet, those two should never have crossed paths. But the Bible says that Jesus must needs go through this place called Samaria. Typically, a Jew would spend an entire day's journey going around Samaria so that they would not have to take any chance of actually encountering a, a person or a Samaritan. So, But Jesus had a divine appointment to keep. And even tonight, brothers and sisters, this could be a divine appointment that God would take these few moments that we have and touch your heart and do something truly amazing. Well, let me just kind of give you the synopsis of the story and what takes place over the first 30 verses or so of John chapter 4. Number one, we see a sensitive Savior. Take some notes. A sensitive Savior. Jesus loved those people in Samaria in spite of the fact that they were hated of the Jewish people. Jesus loved them. We need to follow that and emulate that. Sometimes the church, because we uh, are so quick to be fruit inspectors and we look at the world and we develop almost a hatred toward the people uh, of the world. The Bible tells us, and we've learned all our lives, that we ought to hate sin, but never the sinner. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love 2 Peter 3, verse um, number 9. The Bible says that God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering toward us was not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And I wonder, do we have that sensitive nature? Do we truly want all people to come to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the saving faith uh, that will truly redeem them? Number two, 
we see in this text not only a sensitive Savior, but we see a Samaritan sinner. We don't know all that much about this woman except for what Jesus exposes in her life. But we do know this. She was not going to the downtown well. She was going to the out-of-town well. She was not going early in the morning and in the late of the day when most women would have gone to the well. But she went in the hottest part of the day, in the middle part of the day. So she went to a well that no one went to anymore at a time that no one went to the well. Why? I believe because she wanted to make sure that there would be nobody at that well. Nobody to snicker or to say snide remarks or to call her a name or to point her out. She just wanted to be lost in anonymity, do what she had come to the well to do, draw the water and get on back home. I believe there are a lot of lost people out there today and they really don't want any kind of confrontation. They know they're living a lost life. They know they're not where they need to be. And the last thing they want to do is put themselves out there in a place where they might find criticism or critique. It was an unthinkable conversation that would take place, an unlikely conversion that would take place in John 4 because you know not only the sensitive Savior and the Samaritan uh, sinner, but it comes in verse number uh, 10 through 27, a stunning situation, a conversation is taking place and, and Jesus actually initiates this conversation. Uh, that's pretty interesting to note, by the way. Sometimes we have this idea that God's sitting in the wings and he's waiting on us to call upon him. But ultimately, we are saved when the Holy Spirit of God invites us when he initiates a conversation. Remember, old Lazarus went banging on the grave saying, let me out. But Jesus said, come on out, Lazarus. And it's the same way with the lost person accepting Christ. The stunning, sit, sit, the stunning situation it's about a sin to deal with and a sinner to deliver. It's about repentance and redemption and a conversation that would change this woman's life. Number four, we see a sure salvation. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to share a couple of stories and then just give you a quick outline. Listen, it's important that you and I uh, have a moment that we just examine. Do we truly have a relationship with Christ or is it merely a relationship with the church? Is there some evidence in our life to back up our lip service to the Lord? I remember a story uh, about a young man. He had been a traveling salesman and uh, kind of down on his luck. And he was passing through this little country town. And he stopped at this little filling station to put a few gallons of gas in his car. He went in and there was an old man running the store. had been there for years. And the old man noticed this young businessman looked kind of disheveled a bit. Uh, out of sorts, and he said, young man, everything okay? Is there anything I can do for you? The young man said, well, actually, no, sir, everything's not okay, and maybe there is something you can do for me. Well, if I can help, I'd be glad to, the old man said, and the young man took off his watch, and he said, you know, he said, I'm down on my luck for sure. He said, I've been fired from my job. He said, but this watch is about the most valuable possession that I have. He said, I won it a few years ago for being the top salesman in my company. It's a Rolex. It's worth over $10,000. Sir, I'm dead broke. I wonder if you might be interested in buying my watch. The old man backed away and said, no, sir, I'm afraid I can't do that, son. I don't have that kind of money. He said, no, sir, you don't understand. I'm desperate. He said, sir, if you'll buy this watch, I'll take $1,000 for it. And you can sell it, make the profit, whatever. I don't care. I just need a little money to help me get home. Well, the old man was no dummy. He was a businessman at heart, and he thought for a moment and went in the back room, came out, and he gave the young man $1,000 for that watch. He put it on his arm. He had never had anything shiny like that before in his life. And uh, so later on that day, he went home, and the first thing his wife noticed when he walked in the door was that watch. She said, what on earth is on your arm? He said, I'll explain. And he told the whole story about how the young man had come by down on his luck and how the watch was worth over $10,000, and yet he only paid 1000 He said, honey, by the way, you know, you and I have never had any life insurance, but we have some now. He said, one of these days when I die, you tell the boys to take this watch down to the jeweler. He'll give them a fair price, and you take that money. You pay for my funeral, go on and pay for your funeral. There's enough there to, to pay for two good send-offs. And she thought to herself, well, maybe, maybe I've married a very smart man. 
She said it sounded like a pretty good deal to her. And that old man would wear that watch with pride. He would comment to people about it and show how the little hand smoothly swept around in circle. He'd take it off and let people hold it and feel the weight of a real Rolex. It became his prized possession. A number of years passed and the old man died. And of course, you know what had to happen. The boys took the watch into the jeweler, told Mama, I'll be right back. About an hour later, they came in with a very uh, sad expression on their face. Mama said, what's wrong? Better sit down, Mama. Said, Mama, that Daddy's watch that he's worn all these years, it's not real. Mama, it's a fake. It's not the genuine article. It's not really a Rolex. Oh, no, she said, it's got to be. Your Daddy was sure of it. Said, no, Mama. In fact, the jeweler thought it was when he first saw it. He admired its weight, admired its beauty, admired the motion of its hands. But Mama, the jeweler, took it in the back room, and he took the back cover off, and he looked on the inside. And while everything on the outside looked like a Rolex, nothing on the inside looked like a Rolex. Mama, this is a worthless watch that Daddy was sold. Friend, there are many people on Sunday mornings they get dressed up. All through the week, they say the right things. They, they know how to act the part. They know how to go through the motions. They know how to carry their weight. But at the end of the day, if we were to be opened up and exposed, we would know that there's nothing genuine behind the relationship we claim to have. So tonight, in these few moments that we have together, I want us to look at what took place in the life of the Samaritan woman. I call this evidences of a genuine encounter with Jesus. Here we go. Three things, and I want to be brief, give you something you can hang on to. Three things that we look at tonight. Number one, absolute abandonment. Absolute abandonment. Notice I've got a little a prop, a little visual aid tonight. The Bible says in verse number 28, the woman then, the little four-letter word, the conjunction then, tells us that something took place that led to another event. So what is the then? After she received the living water that Jesus gave her, after she was uh, she dealt with her sin, and after she was uh, brought into a place of conviction and repentance, and she received the salvation that only Christ could give her, the Bible says the first thing she did was then she left her water pot. Or for you and me, it's just an old water pot. But for her, it would have been a source of sustenance for her family. It would have been a cherished possession, a prized possession. You and I have possessions like that. And, and sometimes these things keep us from serving the Lord. Sometimes these things keep us from being able to worship God. I, I wonder sometimes, I was asking someone recently, why is it that young people aren't as faithful in their tithes and offerings? And they said, well, they've just got too many other things. Uh, many times it's our, our cell phones and our, our cable or satellite bill and the latest car and the fanciest house and all of the stuff that we want. And these things prohibit us from truly being able to serve the Lord. If you remember the story of the rich young ruler, oh, he was ripe for the saving. He was ready to accept Christ. But Jesus said, there's one more thing. You've got to sell everything and give it to the poor. Oh, he was so close yet he was not willing to surrender or to turn loose of anything. In this particular text, the woman had to let go of some relationships. She had to abandon a lifestyle. So it was more than just physically leaving a water pot behind, but she was letting go of a lot of things. How about that? There, there's some things in your life and in my life that we need to let go of. I heard it said trying to satisfy our heart with the things of this world is like trying to satisfy physical thirst by drinking from the ocean. The, the more you drink, the thirstier, the, the, the thirstier you will get. I wonder, do we understand that ultimately all that we need comes from the Lord? There was an old man and, a, and his young son, and this widower was raising the boy the best he could, and he found a common love of art, paintings, and portraits and landscapes and they collected this art from all over the world war broke out in the in the land and the young son went off to the army every day the man wondered how his boy was until one day a knock came upon the door and word 
came that his son had been killed in the line of duty. Your son died a hero, it was explained. In fact, he died saving another soldier. You have much to be proud of. And the old man was proud. That home seemed so empty. The artwork so very unimportant after his son passed. The war came to an end and another knock came upon the door. And this was another soldier boy. Carrying a package, he came in and explained that this man's son had died saving his life. This other soldier explained that he himself was an amateur artist, not professional, but he did his best. And he unveiled this painting and it was called A Soldier Boy. And it was a portrait of the old man's son. And that became his prized possession. He hung it above the mantle. He loved that painting and looked at it all the days of his life. The old man passed away. The entire art collecting world got excited because they knew that there would be an auction to end all auctions. And all of these priceless works of art would be sold to the highest bidder. And sure enough, the day came and collectors came in from all over the world to bid on these paintings and portraits. The auctioneer explained that the auction was about to begin and it would start with the painting called A Soldier Boy. And realizing that this was not by a famous artist and had no great value, someone stood and said, why are we even wasting our time? This is not important. Let's get on to the good stuff. The auctioneer explained that according to the old man's will, this had to be the first piece of art auction. Finally, someone said, I think it's beautiful. I'll give $10. $10, I'll take 20 Anybody 20 anywhere, anywhere? There was no advance to the bid, and finally the auctioneer pronounced it sold for $10. He then announced that the auction was over, that it had concluded as fast as it had started. And they said, what do you mean we've come all this way? This is not what we've come to bid on. He said, well, according to the old man's will, whoever purchased the soldier boy gets it all. Friend, when the Lord Jesus Christ willingly came to this earth and he gave up his life, the Bible says that God sacrificed his only begotten son, and he who gave us his son shall freely give us all things. And yet when we're asked to give up something or sacrifice, do we realize that everything we have ultimately has been gifted to us by the very hand of Almighty God, Jehovah that provides, Jehovah Jireh? Do we know that? This particular woman understood that that which she held so dear had to be relinquished. Her lifestyle relinquished, her relationships relinquished, and even symbolically, the pot that she drew water from. Remember, because of the living water that Jesus gave her, spiritually speaking, it would be a river of life flowing, springing up from within her. So there's no need for these things from the world that gives me temporary water at best. Number two, not only do we see in this text that there was absolute abandonment, that the woman left her pot, but secondly, that there was a miraculous mission. Notice what it says, that when she left her water pot, she then went her way into the city. Now, what city? It was the very same city she had come out of. It was the city that she had a terrible relationship uh, after relationship after relationship in. It was the city that she had a reputation uh, that was anything but positive. It was the, the city that she was hated and despised. It was the city that she was ashamed and scorned. But yet she went back into that city. There was a scarlet letter around her neck, but a robe of righteousness upon her back. She loved that city and she understood that God had called her back into that place on a mission that only she could have accomplished. We'll talk about that in just a moment. I don't watch a lot of television and when I do it's typically in black and white. I like old television programs. My favorite probably being Andy Griffith. There's an episode of Andy Griffith called The Big House. Let me set it up for you. Andy and Barney and Gomer and Opie are sitting around the radio listening to Leonard Blush. They're there in the courthouse. And they break in with news that four men have escaped from the state penitentiary and are now at large. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We have just found out that two of these four escapees have been caught, captured, and are now on their way to the Mayberry Courthouse. The Mayberry Courthouse, Opie says. Quickly, Opie and Gomer are shooed out of the courthouse and preparations was made to take these two 
prisoners in and lock them up. Sure enough, they came in, they locked him in the cells. Andy went over and grabbed the shotgun, handed Barney the key, and said, Barney, you keep an eye on these two prisoners. I'm going after the two that are still out there. Not once, not twice, but three times, Barney would let these two prisoners escape. And not once, not twice, but three times, Andy would have to recapture the same two prisoners. And finally, Andy gets right up in Barney's face and he says, Barney, if I have to keep catching these same two prisoners over and over and over again, I'll never be able to go after those that are still out there. I saw this years ago and it convicted me. And I realized that as a pastor, I spend so much of my time trying to keep people in the church in the church, keeping them happy and satisfied and, and making sure that I get a positive vote, if you will. But at the same time, while I'm doing all of this work, keeping those two that are already caught, I'm letting go of those that need to be caught. I'm not out there on my mission. Ultimately, the most important job and duty for any believer is seeking and saving that which was lost. That's what Jesus came to earth for, and that is our miraculous mission. So this woman had received living water. Her life has been radically changed, and the very first response was to go back into the city on mission for Jesus. You see, it changes you, you know. Number three, and we'll close. Not only do we see an absolute abandonment, we see a miraculous mission, but thirdly, we see a passionate pursuit. So what took place? She went her way into the city and she said to all the men, Come, see a man which told me all that I ever did. This is the Christ. She was passionate about her message. She desperately wanted the people of the city to meet the same master that she had met. She wanted the living water to be given to them that had been given to her. You know, there's something contagious about Christianity. If we truly get a dose of the gospel, we want to give it away. We're praying for a, a vaccine from COVID-19, the coronavirus. And, and I imagine if it could be bought tonight, no price would be too high. We would buy it. And then we, we wouldn't hoard it up just for ourselves like we're doing toilet paper and lunch meat these days. But we would share it with everybody because we would want everybody to have this vaccine and everybody to be healed from this disease. The gospel is the only cure from the disease of sin that is not only internal, but it is eternal. And yet we do not give it away. Yet we are not on a mission and passionately pursuing the people who desperately need to hear some good news. I love the story of Johnny. He's a young city slicker boy like me. Grew up far from the country, but during the summer of his 13th year, he was invited by his grandparents to come to the farm for a week. And Johnny went out and on the first morning got up at 5 a.m., went out to the barn, fed the animals that needed feeding, cleaned the stalls that needed cleaning, gathered the eggs, did all the things in the barn that had to be done. Then he came in and had quite a meal. Scrambled eggs and cut your ham and home fried potatoes and cat head biscuits and, and sawmill gravy. Man, it was good. Johnny had about three helpings and then he got missing. And Grandpa looked around and said, where is Johnny? Grandma hadn't seen him. She didn't know. Finally, he found Johnny fast asleep on the bed. He woke him up and said, Johnny, what are you doing? He said, well, Grandpa, all of our work is done. And Grandpa sat down and said, no, Johnny. What we do in the barn, those are our chores. It's what we do out in the fields. Now, that's our work. You see, this woman realized that there was work to be done. Church folks, I want to tell you what you do in the church is wonderful. Serving on committees and keeping the nursery and teaching children's church and Sunday school, singing in the choir and serving as a deacon or even as a pastor on staff, whatever it might be. But ultimately, God's not called us just to do our chores in the barn, but he's called us to do our work in the field. Well, let me just close it up. You might be thinking, well, could this woman possibly have been effective in her evangelistic efforts? Could anybody have even given her a second look or listen? 
Would anybody have accepted Christ because of the testimony of this woman? What a terrible reputation she had. Again, I remind you of verse 30, 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him because of the sayings of this woman. In fact, only she could have taken such a bold message into her village. I want to tell you something you might not have ever thought about. When it comes to the Samaritan woman, she's quite a character. But do you know that the Samaritan woman was successful in one arena that Jesus actually failed in? Now, don't hang up on the, me yet. Here it is. The Bible says of Jesus that in Nazareth, that's where he was brought up. That was his hometown. In Nazareth, Jesus did no mighty works because of their unbelief. But in Samaria, in the village of this Samaritan woman, God did a mighty work. And many people came to faith in Jesus. Wow. The Samaritan woman will go down in the pages of New Testament history as one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Her ministry and message was so effective that it reached the masses of her community. You may be watching this and thinking, well, I'm not a preacher, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not a teacher. Oh, you are. For every step you take, you're teaching a lesson. Every word you speak, you're preaching a message. If you're saved, you have an evangelistic testimony to share. Why don't we get serious sharing? Why do we need to share our testimony? Why do we need to share the story of Jesus? Because if we don't, who will? Say, so well, I'm just not all that equipped. Well, let me tell you what it all boils down to. One last story. There was a gentleman who lived in Dublin many, many years ago. His name was Graham Robison. And Graham was known for being sort of the welcome wagon. He would stand out on the town limits and wave at folks as they came in and as they left town. Graham was a tiny frame of a man, long gray beard, eyes deep sunk into his head. Graham's health grew a bit weak. And one day he had a massive heart attack. Now Graham loved the Lord. And ultimately that's what it's all about. Graham's brother came to visit him in the hospital, and the doctor said to his brother, David, I'm afraid there's nothing more that we can do. Graham's heart is so damaged, he probably won't make it through the night. And David sat down on the bed beside his brother and said, Graham, it's David. Graham's eyes opened up. He said, Graham, do you know that Jesus loves you? Graham, do you know that Jesus loves you? Graham looked up and said, me no, me no. David said, Graham, do you know that Jesus is coming for you and he's coming soon? The last words that Graham Robinson would ever utter on this side of eternity. He'd open his eyes real big with a great big smile on his face. And he said, me ready, me ready. Friend, evangelism is just one old beggar telling another old beggar where to find bread and to make sure that this world knows what Graham Robinson knew, that Jesus loves him and that he's coming soon. May God bless you. May God encourage you. If there's something you need to abandon tonight, maybe a lifestyle, a relationship, a habit, an addiction, Maybe it's anxiety and fret and worry. All these things you just need to turn loose of and trust God with you. Maybe it's a mission that we need to embark on. Someone we need to share our faith with and a passion that needs to be restored. You can learn a lot from this Samaritan woman and I pray that we have. Father, thank you for this amazing testimony of an unlikely hero of scripture. Lord, her past was anything but glamorous. But the story we read tonight was nothing short of glorious. Give us the strength to abandon some things, to hold fast to some things, and to make known the gospel message. 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, my beloved. I'll see you next time.